Her Schulfenman here. You are listening to the Jewish Hour. We are on live with noted author and lecturer, Rabbi Simone Jacobson. We're going to be talking about Tisha B'Av. How are you today, Simone? Thank you very much. And how about you? Good. Thank God. I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. Okay. The holiday at Tisha B'Av, or the commemoration of the memorial of Tisha B'Av, is coming up. On August 6th, it's looked upon as being the quote-unquote black day on the Jewish calendar. Tell us, give a little insight, first of all, what's so bad about Tisha B'Av, Rabbi Jacobson? <laughs> what's so bad, huh? Yeah. You, I don't like to be the bearer of bad news. So. Okay. I think I know how this <laughs> one that, ends, though. So. Yeah, well, look at, look, look at it this way. Life has cycles. You know, there are ups and downs. There are times that we're joyous of celebrating days of marriage, days of birth, uh, other forms of um, achievement. And then, sadly, life also has the down points, the ebb and flow, the turns and twists and turns. And they are the sad days when we grieve over a loss of a, of a loved one or another tragedy or trauma. So in the Jewish calendar, which is so much aligned with the uh, the way human life works, we have like a month of Adar, considered to be the most joyous of months, the month of Purim, celebration. And in stark contrast, we have the other end of the spectrum, the antithesis to that, which is the month of Av, this sad month, um, which we remember and relive and remember and commemorate the sad event that happened. And primarily among the different events is, of course, the most famous one was the destruction of both holy temples, which interestingly happened hundreds of years apart, but both on the 9th of Av, as you said, this year, August 6th. And um, even though it happened thousands of years ago, it's not just a past event. We see it as a watershed moment where, uh, if, if we wish, you can call it like the birth of dissonance, a birth of disconnect between heaven and earth, between spirit and matter, because the temple represented God's presence among us, and uh, when that presence is concealed, it's, uh, it's quite, quite sad, quite tragic. So I wouldn't call it a bad day. I would call it a, tr- a challenging day, okay. a day when we have to do things to uh, obviously repair that dissonance. Okay. I am reminded of two quotes. The first one, I don't know to whom it should be attributed, and that was, if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to repeat your mistakes. And the other one is attributed to Napoleon, who somehow was walking in some Jewish neighborhood someplace and heard that Jews were weeping, and what were they weeping about? And he was told their destruction of the temple, and he said, oh, how long ago was the temple destroyed? And he said, 1,700 years ago. And he said, a nation that can cry and fast for 1,700 years for their land and temple will surely be rewarded with their temple. Um, like I say, I don't know if that's a real quote or it's like it appears up if you quote, if you uh, type in Tisha B'Av and Napoleon, you get all kinds of sources all over the place on Google. But so are or we... Is it urban legend, right? Right. Yeah. Or is it urban legend? And so w- is there really a point to observing something that happened two th- almost 2,000 years ago? Well, first of all, whether he said it or not is a good question, but regardless, the, the truth of it is a deep one. And uh, let me answer that uh, to your uh, question as well. And that is, if you grieve just to grieve and to cry, then and it leads, leads you to demoralization and to nothing positive and productive, then the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Shneerzam and Tanya, already established anything that demoralizes you and doesn't motivate you, it's not called sadness, it's called depression. And it's a negative force that is only bringing you down. However, if crying and grieving is a motivator and it's a sensitivity of empathy to pain, which means you're not oblivious and you don't say, oh, let's just move on. Yes, there's something to cry about. Like in the words of Ecclesiastes, there's a time to cry, there's a time to, uh, to dance. So or using the word of the, of the, of the verse in the book of Psalms, that those that sow in tears will reap in joy, and then Napoleon's remark comes alive in a very powerful way. It's not about just sitting and crying. Look at the Jewish people. We've cried, but we've also built. We went through the Holocaust. And look at the renaissance of Jewish life, including Israel and so much more that came afterwards. So life 
to, to ignore pain and suffering in life is simply is not healthy. It would be like someone saying, no, nothing happened, let's just move on. I mean, psychologically, we call that denial. We call that uh, silence, silencing, what they say, silence, the silence is worse than the, than the crime. And that is not healthy. So acknowledging that things that have happened that are negative is very healthy. But step two, it's not an end in itself. It has to bring to uh, building, and, and that's a, the key. I think if, everyone's, if anyone would study the psychological model of the Jewish people, you literally see we suffered like no other nation, but we also built a resilience like no other nation. I mean, using the words of the, the Bible, Medrudis, the more they were afflicted, afflicted the Jewish people and oppressed, the more they thrived and they flourished. Okay, our guest today is Rabbi Simone Jacobson, noted lecturer and author. We're talking about the commemorative day of Tisha B'Av, marking the remembrance of the destruction of both temples in Jerusalem and other things. Okay, so I can understand commemorating Tisha B'Av if it was, say, like the year 90, and I really miss the temple. And it's like something I miss, and it's just like I used to go there, and I'd celebrate Passover with the Paschal Lamb, and I had this whole thing over there going on, and it's like I'm I'm really upset about it. But it's the year 2020, 2022, excuse me, and um, – I don't feel that I lost a temple because I never had one. It's sort of like I was a little personal thing. I was born four months after my father passed away. And when I was a kid, people would ask me, well, what's it like not having a father? And I would say, I don't know, because I never had a father to compare it to. So isn't this sort of like the same kind of thing as we're, we're told? I mean, I've, I've said Yisker since I was four years old to memory of my father's soul, but are we doing this just out of duty? Should there be something there, Rabbi Jacobson? An excellent question. And firstly, my heart goes out to you. I was not aware. It was it was uh, sixty four years ago, so don't worry about it. I'm, I, I've managed to yeah, get well, through this far. If we're still mourning a building almost two thousand years, but sixty four years. Okay. Right? Um, but but still, and I think it's a good segue because, and I'm glad you brought the personal into it. Because this is a critical question. It just reminds me of another question I hear very often from many young men and women, Jewish men and women. They say, you know, I'm sick and tired of hearing that, that about anti-Semitism and all we stand for is anti-anti-Semitism and anti-racism. You know, that they're trying to kill us. You know, the joke goes, they try to kill us. We survive. Let's eat. Right. You know, and it comes down to being a very, um, very superficial so I think it's a powerful question, and uh, and the answer really lies, as Jews like to answer question with a question, in a very powerful statement in the Talmud, in the Jerusalemite Talmud. It says that a, a, a generation that has not rebuilt the temple is considered as if it destroyed it, which obviously you know jumps out at you. One second. It was destroyed thousands of years ago due to the sins of our ancestors. Why are we to blame? You know, one thing is, okay, we'll try to fix it, but why are we as if we destroyed it? Because the key is to remember that we're not grieving over a building. There are many beautiful buildings that have been destroyed in history. We're grieving over divine presence. The, 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 the Chumash, the, the Bible puts it beautifully. God said, build me a sanctuary and I will dwell among you. The temple was a uh, essentially an interface, using modern terms, between the divine and us. And it's like when you're aligned to the purpose of your life, that's what the temple represented. And, of course, the destruction, which was a result, interestingly, of baseless hatred. It wasn't that, oh, you know, the Romans came or the Babylonians came and destroyed the temple. Once the people were not at peace with each other, so God simply said, I can't be among my children that are fighting with each other. I just can't be there. So it's not just an event that happened thousands of years ago. It's happening right now. Every time there's a form of hatred any form of dissonance that I mentioned, any form, uh, a loss of a parent like you, in your life. Every loss we see as being a mini destruction. And that's why we remember the destruction of the temple when we when we marry off our children. Under the canopy, we break a glass. It's not just a distant memory. It's right now, every time some heart is broken, anyone that's experiencing any loss or trauma or hurt or pain, that is a, a, a representation and could say a personification of the destruction. 
And that's why when we grieve, we're not just remembering events of the past, but we're remembering every sad moment in our lives today or in the lives of our family or lives of strangers, for that matter. And we need to do everything possible to remedy that, and that's why we pray for the rebuilding of the temple. For the same reason, because we want to recreate and reconnect with the divine in our lives. Fascinating. Our guest again today is Rabbi Simon Jacobson, noted lecturer and author. We're talking about commemorating the holiday of Tisha B'Av and in modern times. Okay, so you segued into my next question, next point I wanted to bring up. You said before, quoting Ecclesiastes, there's a time to laugh, a time to mourn. We have the month of Adar when we're supposed to be really happy, and nobody's thinking about the destruction of the temple, I don't think, except maybe if you're Jewing in Jerusalem on Shushan Purim. Uh, and but then in Adar, so we are in Av, so we have this whole month where we're kind of thinking about the destruction, and then we have these like cycle things that go on, like the breaking of the glass underneath the marriage can- wedding canopy. And um, if you walk into my house, you'll see right in front of you as you walk in a very large mirror, and behind that large mirror is a very large unpainted part of the wall. So as to commemorate the uh, the fact that we're not going to decorate our house, houses fully because we're in this state of mourning. And there are laws, like for in Jerusalem, you're supposed to only have, if you get married in Jerusalem, you're only supposed to have one musician because of the destruction of the temple. So are, it sounds like we're, we're supposed to be like uh, a dual personality over here, Rabbi Jacobson. Sometimes we're supposed to be happy. We're supposed to be mourning when we're happy. We're supposed to be happy when we're mourning. This is this is going to get rather confusing. Well, I, I go back to uh, what I said earlier about navigation. You know, the fact of the matter of life is not a uh, what, what shall we say a uh, singular a singular uh, equilibrium. It's more like a cardiogram. You know, there's uh, it's a waves, and there are peaks and there are valleys. And the thing to really appreciate about life is to know, learn to navigate the vicissitudes, to navigate these waves. It's not to fight them. If, for example, let's I'll use a business example. Someone's running a business and there's a recession or there's some downturn. So it's not a time to grieve. It's a time to now maybe introspection. You uh, look deeper into your, 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 your processes and so on. And then there are times where you can really go thrust forward or like a good swimmer. When there's a storm, you learn to ride the waves and you don't fight the tide. So I think that when you really appreciate uh, the cycles of, you mentioned you know, the celebration of other, and on the other hand, we have of, it's not about bringing us down. It's about appreciating that life is going to have its ups and downs. I remember hearing something really nice. When the first Ferris wheel was uh, invented, it was in Vienna. Vienna had, I think, an amusement park. It's famous for Ferris wheel. When Word of that Ferris wheel came to Lubavitch, which was the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Chabad Rebbe. So it happened to be someone had come to him, a businessman who was, uh, had lost a lot of money, and he was really down. And the Rebbe said to him, the lesson from the Ferris wheel is that life is a galgal hachoza. It's a turning wheel. When you're on top, you can rest assured the wheel will turn. There will be moments when you'll be going downward. And when you're down below, remember the wheel continues to turn. It will and if you appreciate that, instead of living in the moment, but seeing it like a journey, a journey, a narrative, and like, like frames in a, in a film, you, the film isn't over till it's over, you, you see that it's a bigger picture of ups and downs, twists and turns, and all together create one beautiful uh, harmony of uh, both joy and sadness. And in that sense, the sadness is part of the growth and part of the joy as well. Okay. Now, Hasidim have seemed, there seems to be a certain flippancy when it comes to Tisha B'Av. Last week I told the story about Menachem Mendel of Kotsk, and his Hasidim pro- pulled a practical joke on him, a practical joke on Tisha B'Av and his explanation. Today I'll be talking a story about Shmuel Monkus and, and Shlomo Karlin. Everybody should stay tuned when Shlomo Karlin came to visit the Alter Rebbe on Tisha B'Av. And the Rebbe himself translating a, a discussion in the Talmud, like for this year, for example, Tisha B'Av is actually on Shabbos, and you can't fast on Shabbos except for Yom Kippur. So what do they do? They push it off. They just say, you push it off, and Rebbe Yudif comes and says, no, nah, even since it was pushed off, you push it off completely, meaning till next year. And the Rebbe would say, well, since we pushed it off, and we're pushing it off completely, maybe completely means 
that Mashiach should come and we shouldn't have to do it again. So there seems to be this added, this, I wouldn't, don't know if I want to say laissez-faire, nonchalant attitude towards Tisha B'Av among Hasidim, Rabbi Jacobson? That you make, um, it, it's, it's, this, it's this, you know, when you um, go to a shiva call, you go visit someone who's sitting and mourning the loss of a loved one. You obviously don't start making somersaults and start dancing and singing. You have to be sensitive to the moment. But at the same time, you don't want to create a situation that just contributes to the somberness and let's make it even sadder. You know, there's a word in the Hebrew Yiddish called mahader. You don't have to mahader in the pain. You don't have to overdo it, so to speak. So you need to have a proper healthy balance of empathy of recognition and sensitivity. But, you know, sometimes you could make a joke if it's in the right taste. Not to not to lighten the mood, just to realize that life is not just pure, 100% sadness. I mean, there are people I meet when something sad happens, they're almost like looking forward to it, and they like to celebrate their sadness. If you know what I mean? Right. Um, and I think what Chassidim have introduced was an attitude. Yes, there are sad moments, and there are very sad moments. Terrible things have happened to people individually, collectively. But there's also a simchas hachaim. I'm using Hebrew here. There's a certain even that when you're sad, there's still, you, you still celebrate that you exist, that you're alive. And don't let sadness define your life. I mean, that's a good way to put it. It happens to you, but don't let it define you. And I think that's what lies behind those stories where they said, you know, okay, if, if they're, not, if they're, not, if they're not really celebrating this holiday, take it away from them. And let's finally have the redemption and let's only have celebrating days. So it's a way of wherever we can, we try to redeem or we try to find the the light at the end of the tunnel, or some people say the light within the tunnel, you know. Uh, Rabbi Simone Jacobson, may I ask you a personal question? <laughs> of course. Okay. How do you plan on commemorating Tisha B'Av this year? <laughs> I didn't realize that personal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm specifically, I'm specifically answered it in Tish above afternoon when there's like all the services are done and it's just like it's like five hours until the, the holiday is over and you're on your own is really what I'm interested in. But go ahead. I, yeah. Well, I'll be honest with you. Um, I didn't think about it yet. I still have a week to prepare. Um, I can tell you in the past, I, I always had mixed feelings on Tish above because on one hand, I do respect and appreciate, uh, obviously, as growing up in the Jewish community, we dim the lights and we remember, and it's very, it's awesome in a way. I was also in Israel a few times, you know, thousands of people that come to the Western Wall. So I find it to be a type of, um, it's almost comforting, the fact that we remember, we remember something like that. I, uh, on the other hand, being growing up in a Hasidic environment, I always feel, what can I do? a remedy to help repair the situation. So I'll be honest, I'll probably be using Tisha B'Av as a, a time to think about things that we can do to advance love and understanding and cooperation. Now, we live in a very tumultuous times. We live in tumultuous times with a lot of, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of polarization. So I, I'll be using that day to do what I think is my mission in this world, is to bring some light into the world. Okay, that's, that's how I see Tisha B'Av, an opportunity of bringing light into darkness. That's perfect. Okay, Rabbi Simone Jacobs, a noted author and lecturer. Well, thank you so much for coming in and sharing your insights. And I'd like to wish you a happy Tisha B'Av, which would mean Mashiach has already come between now and then, and we're in Jerusalem, and as the Rambam Maimonides says, it'll be actually the, the brightest spot on the calendar, and wish you all the best. Okay, thank you so much, and may you have the same and only transformative experiences personally and continue your great work on the airwaves. Thank you so much.